Southern Ontario and Quebec are home to some of Canada's most accessible parks. In Killarney Provincial Park, White Mountains frame crystal clear lakes. Two hours away, Algonquin Provincial Park draws canoeists, anglers and hikers hoping to explore the historical landscape. And in La Mauricie National Park, a dense forest is waiting for adventure seekers. Killarney Provincial Park is known for its inspirational landscape. The park is located on the northern edge of Georgian Bay, Ontario. Killarney is the southernmost wilderness park in the province. And our policies are to have wilderness available for recreation, but also for natural areas in the province and in representing certain regions of the province. So that we can have these, these places for all time. Established in 1964, this protected wilderness spans 485 square kilometers. Killarney is a really unique place in Ontario and Canada and the world really. Uh, there, there are several things that make it unique. Uh, there are the white quartzite hills. Uh, there, there are three ranges of mountains that are 1,500 feet high. Uh, there's the Georgian Bay Coast and the ultra clear lakes. The area was also protected uh, from development. The diverse landscape is home to a variety of plant life and trees. The most common forest in the park here is the hemlock yellow birch forest. And the 24% of the park is, has that forest type in it. And that is very unusual. You, you don't usually find that concentration of uh, of yellow birch uh, hemlock. And it's partly because of the mountains. Uh, they like to grow on north facing slopes. There's some huge uh, yellow birch in the park that are five, six feet in diameter. Well, Killarney is a uh, part of the boreal landscape uh, and it encircles the earth uh, in uh, uh, Scandinavia, Russia, all have this same landscape, much of northern Canada. So they take note of uh, the effectiveness of things happening in North America and sites like Killarney. Throughout the park, pine and hardwood forests cover the highlands, while boggy lowlands surround the waterways. More than 500 crystal clear lakes span across the landscape. Here, park visitors can see up to 20 meters below the water's surface. Early travelers were, uh, were well aware of Killarney as a, as a spectacular uh, place of ultra clear water. And uh, it's known worldwide as uh, having some of the clearest waters, um, uh, lakes like Lake Tahoe or Crater Lake are, are famous in North America, but uh, Nelly Lake here in the park is probably equal to, if not uh, greater clarity than those. So we're looking at some of the clearest lakes in the world.
we lack fish populations in some of these lakes, but uh, they're great for swimming. They're beautiful, clear blue topaz colored waters that are highly scenic. And uh, that's an attraction in itself. People don't come here for fishing. They come here because of the, the beauty of the scenery. Killarney's aesthetic appeal and rich geological history draws visitors from around the globe. It's just absolutely the crown jewel. It uh, has unique rock formations, uh, geological formations, uh, has uh, prehistoric stone quarries in the park that go date back thousands of years. We're right at the edge of the, of the meeting of what was a, one of the most massive mountain ranges on earth, the Grenville Front, and uh, an ancient seafloor that forms the La Crosse Mountains. When you see the white rocks in the background, uh, it uh, puts you back a billion years when that white formation was an uh, underground uh, seafloor and was pushed up here uh, and formed those, those white quartzite hills. And the red uh, granites in the foreground were the volcanic uh, intrusions that were, were happening at the uh, time. This is the end result, the La Cloche Mountains. The distinct mountain range stretches across the northern shore of one of Canada's greatest lakes, Lake Huron. I guess at one time they were a sand beach about a mile thick and they metamorphosed uh, and they're, they're white quartz rock. Some of them create fjords, uh, like structures that are seven or eight kilometers long. It's such an attractive uh, setting with the La Cloche Hills, with a variety of uh, sizes and, uh, and, and the, uh, the scenery of the lakes. Come fall, the park's peak season begins as the changing color of leaves burst into a sea of red, orange, and yellow. This is the southernmost wilderness park in the province of Ontario. So it kind of brings a, kind of a double edge that way because it's, it's the closest park that offers those kinds of recreational pursuits for backcountry wilderness, canoeing and hiking. But it's the closest to the largest populations of Ontario. So there's a, a lot of people that come here to, to see that uh, wilderness landscape. The postcard setting is so in demand, overnight campers need to book five months in advance. People come here, you know, beginning of uh, the season, I've seen uh, ice on the lake still and, and cars in the parking lot with canoes on them. They're uh, wanting to get into this park. If you were thinking of Killarney as a place to come, it's firstly about recreation. You can go from the car camping into uh, backcountry camping, and it's either canoe camping from uh, the canoe routes from the many lakes in the park, or we've got an extensive network of hiking trails, the longest of which is the La Cloche Silhouette Trail. And it's, it's billed as 100 kilometers. It's less than that, but it is a, a long distance hiking trail where you never cross a road in the distance of uh, from you, when you start to where you end, you never see a road. Around the corner from Killarney is another provincial park considered the grandfather of Ontario's park system. This is Algonquin Provincial Park. Located between Georgian Bay and the Ottawa River in central Ontario, Algonquin is the oldest park in the province. The dense forest cover resonates with Canadians who view this landscape as part of their cultural identity.
The park's interior is home to more than 2,400 lakes and 1,200 kilometers of rivers and streams. Algonquin Provincial Park is Ontario's largest provincial park. At more than 7,600 square kilometers, it dwarfs every other park in southern Ontario. Well, Algonquin is different than a lot of other parks in just in terms of the size. Now, there are larger parks, but those larger parks tend to be far in the north. So just in terms of such a large wilderness area so close to people, it makes it different. Though huge, Algonquin is easy to navigate. A network of canoe routes crisscrosses the park. If I had the opportunity, I would like to be able to canoe into every lake and every river that's in the park. I've been to quite a few of them, but there are some places that I still haven't had a chance to explore. And probably to fish some of those lakes as well, because I know that there are some trophy fish waiting to be caught. You'd have to go way, way far north in parts of Canada to find anything equivalent to what's available here in the park. The park, Algonquin Park, has numbers of watersheds beginning here off the Algonquin Dome, as we call it, to get at high elevation. And those kinds of habitats, plus the isolation of the park, it's just hard to get into these lakes, really help preserve the brook trout populations in the park. The lakes of Algonquin Provincial Park contain the world's highest concentration of brook trout. The park is significant because of the representation of brook trout lakes here in the park. They used to be more common across the landscape, what people would recognize as cottage country. But uh, with species introductions and other things, uh, that's pretty much Algonquin Park now as the home for lake populations of brook trout and stream populations, their traditional habitat. Nestled within the park are several research facilities used by scientists from across the country. Because brook trout are good indicators of landscape condition around a lake, not just in the lake, uh, and, the, and the numbers of lake populations that are still thriving in Algonquin Park, we, we can conclude that the, that the landscape is really in good shape in Algonquin Park. It has not really been altered significantly in any way for a long, long time. Ongoing research helps determine the lifespan of fish within the park's lakes and rivers. Several species of fish are removed, tagged, then returned to the waters. So when we're tagging fish, what the tag returns tell us is just how much they survive from one year to the next. And as the tags disappear out of the population, then we know the survival rate from one year to the next for the tagged fish. Anglers play a role in gathering vital clues. It's voluntary, uh, and most anglers, frankly, I've encountered, enjoy being part of the survey. They want to know that their information that they collect and contribute is actually helping, and it does. In the fall, the forests of Algonquin transform. It is the busiest time of the year for park management. Thousands of visitors come from around the world to experience the spectacular bursts of color. The show begins with the sugar and red maple trees, which turn in mid-September to October, followed closely by the aspens, tamaracks, and red oaks just weeks later.
Well, Algonquin's special for, for so many reasons, and I think it's because it's so complex, it's so diverse, and it has such a great history. For one thing, it's this big chunk of wild space so close to so many people, 7,700 square kilometers, and yet it's within three hours drive of about 10 million people. For many Canadians, Algonquin Provincial Park is their first introduction into the wild. So for many people, it's their very first experience at a wilderness experience. For myself, my very first canoe trip ever was in Algonquin Park. And so many people have stories like that. So whether it's their first canoe trip, their first camping trip, uh, maybe their first time they saw a wolf or, or an, another animal, there's just so much about it that's so special and, and it has such a rich history. In southern Quebec is another park where a major sporting event takes the spotlight. Halfway between Quebec City and Montreal is La Morassi National Park. The park covers 500 square kilometers of the southern Canadian Shield, which is home to a rocky landscape of hills, lakes, and dense forests. At one point, these mountains were as tall as the Himalayas, but years of erosion have worn them down. Today, visitors come to La Morassi for some of the best canoeing in the country. La Morissé, the region, and La Morissé National Park is really the, the canoe world. Uh, you have uh, probably 90% of our park visitors engage in some, somehow in an aquatic activity, either canoeing, uh, fishing, or swimming. And uh, as you notice when you travel in this park, is most of our facilities are located near lake shores. Uh, we do have picnic grounds, we do have campgrounds, uh, we do have primitive campsites, and all the time we made sure in this park to make it blend with the environment and make it close to the lake shores so that the visitors once again really enjoy uh, the, the lake environment. They can see the scenery, uh, they, can, uh, they, can, they can walk on the beaches, uh, they can swim, uh, and, and this is what makes La Maurice what it is today. Behind the water's edge is a pristine forest. A staggering 93% of the park is covered by trees. We have a mixed forest type of landscape. And when comes the, uh, the fall, uh, the, the deciduous trees, uh, the, the white birch, uh, the yellow birch, uh, the maple trees change color. And they changed in very, a variety of hues and a variety of color, going from the yellows to the, the red and the, the oranges. And mixed with the, uh, the coniferous trees that are stay green, it creates this tapestry of uh, incredible colors. And this probably lasts for a couple of weeks during the fall. The park is in the transition zone between boreal and hardwood forests. Evergreen fir, pine, and spruce trees grow in the lowlands. Higher up, sugar maple and yellow birch dominate the area.
Those who come really enjoy the, the, the quietness of the environment, they enjoy the smell, they enjoy the color, uh, they enjoy the fact that uh, there is uh, hiking trails available. We have 200 kilometers of hiking trail in the park so they can discover parts of the park that they don't see in the summer months. Uh, because of it's too hot to walk far away or there's too many flies or mosquitoes for that matter. Every September, La Morrissey National Park plays host to the Defi Velo Meg, a cycling race which draws international attention. Racers travel 105 kilometers through the park, biking up and down La Morrissey's rolling hills. The Defi gives cyclists a chance to experience the park in a whole new way. Uh, the Parc de la Mauricie is actually my favorite place in all of Quebec and so far actually in all of Canada to ride my bike. Uh, the quality of the asphalt is amazing, there's not much traffic and um, just the, the, the scenery is beautiful, the, the trees, the twisting roads, um, even after the race you can go and, and swim, there are, there are so many like lakes, there are waterfalls that you can go play in and stuff like that. I, gotta, I have to remember every single year to sign up for this in the spring because it fills up really, really fast. I mean every single year there are more and more and more people. The parks of southern Ontario and Quebec give millions of Canadians a chance to experience their country's natural beauty. The, the fall time is very special in the Maurice Park. And I'm talking about the hikers, but the canoeists do the same thing. When you're canoeing on the lake like uh, Lac La Pêche, uh, you see those uh, fantastic hues uh, of uh, colors. Uh, uh, th th this this makes it a very special place. More and more, the camping experience is really what defines Algonquin now. So whether it's Highway 60 car camping or whether it's truly a backcountry experience, it has it all. Parks are important to both the country and to people, local people that live near them and like to visit them. They're there, we need wild places that are biological reserves or, where ecosystems are still intact and people still need to have contact with nature. Uh, we're part of nature and being out in parks gives people an opportunity to do that reconnection with nature. In Northern Ontario, Canada's parks preserve some of the country's most rugged landscapes. Quetico Provincial Park is home to sandy beaches, lush forests, and lakes full of fish. At Sleeping Giant Provincial Park, a mythical watchman stands guard over the city of Thunder Bay.
and at Puckasaw National Park, visitors are treated to breathtaking vistas of Lake Superior. Quetico Provincial Park is more than 4,700 square kilometers in size. It is filled with lakes, rivers, and streams. The park is located in northwestern Ontario and is adjacent to the Minnesota border in the United States. Rugged terrain blankets the park's interior. Quetico is a pretty unique area because it, um, it's, it's within a, a mixed forest region, but it's, uh, it's right on the southern boundary. Um, surprisingly, when you look at Quetico, you wouldn't know that the prairies are just a few miles to the south of us. So it's, it's pretty unique in, in that you're getting the, the southern boundary of a lot of species here. Uh, it's also unique in that you don't find large wilderness areas like this um, in such a southern part of the, the province. Quetico is a wilderness park where wildlife and vegetation are protected and the park develops naturally. It's an untouched wilderness. There have been very few um, impacts from human beings. When you go into Quetico, you really do feel like you're in a place that has been existing since you know, the beginning of time, really. So I think biologically, it's, it's really important because we'll find out more and more about the ecology of the, of the area by studying wilderness parks than we probably anywhere else. The region was formed after the last ice age. The glaciers advanced and pushed through here and then reached their, uh, the peak of the advancement about 20,000 years ago. And, and that was way down in southern Minnesota all the way into Iowa. As the planet warmed, the ice began to melt. As the glacier retreated, it was obviously warming up. And so an enormous amount of ice. I mean, there would have been a kilometer of ice over our heads here at the peak of the glaciation. So an amazing volume of water melted off the glacier as it was retreating. Precambrian bedrock covered in soil allowed boreal forests to take hold. When you're at the pines, it's, it's amazing. It's this, I don't know, two or 300 meter long sand white sand beach with big uh, red pine up behind you and then you're looking straight west uh, down one of the biggest lakes in, uh, in Quetico Park. I, th I think that the main advantage is that it, it's, a, it's a, uh, unusual for Quetico to have that size or even that number of uh, sand beaches. In 1909, this vast open space became a forest and game reserve. You had a, a lot of logging moving into the area, and so of course these logging camps, <laughs> they require a lot of protein, a lot of food. And so there were people that went out and their job was to kill moose and to bring back uh, food for the logging camps. And, and so the, the, the population of, of wildlife was definitely uh, decreasing. Concern over preserving the park's forest and wildlife quickly surpassed logging interests. By the early 1900s, the world was, was changing, 
and a number of people began to be concerned about the the loss of the forests and also the word slaughter and decimation were used about the the animals that were in this area particularly the the moose Today, Quetico's moose population is closely monitored. While many park visitors come here to view the wildlife, it's the rivers and lakes which are the park's star attraction. So here at Quetico, we are the start right where the, uh, the tipping point between the Atlantic and the Arctic watershed. Quetico is just inside the Arctic watershed, so all the water basically starts here and flows north into the Arctic Ocean. Quetico's world-class reputation is built on 1,400 kilometers of canoe routes. It's basically a canoe tripping wilderness. And what makes it so different from other canoe tripping wildernesses is, is the opportunity for variety. On any lake that you might find yourself, you can have five or six different routes out of that lake. Known as Canada's canoeing capital, canoeists can paddle for days without encountering another person. I, I think that o over time, if, if you don't protect these lands, they're just going to be eroded and, and abused. And ultimately, I think we'll all suffer. I think everybody needs to know that places like this exist, even if you're not going out and paddling in them. It's important that we cut down trees and mine and do all these things. We have to do those things as well. But I don't think it's asking too much to put aside certain areas like this and protect them. Not far from Quetico is Sleeping Giant Provincial Park, where a mythical giant is on guard. Sleeping Giant Provincial Park was voted one of the Seven Wonders of Canada. The park spans more than 200 square kilometers on the Sibley Peninsula, jutting out into Lake Superior. The park was established in 1944 and originally named uh, Sibley Provincial Park. It was regulated in 1950 and the name was actually changed to Sleeping Giant Provincial Park in 1988 to reflect the most prominent feature of the park, which is the uh, Mesa land formation known as the Sleeping Giant. For many people, the natural rock formation looks like a giant man sleeping. Hiking to the top of the giant will reward visitors with unbeatable views of Lake Superior. The giant and the surrounding area took billions of years to form. When you look at the landforms here, you have these immense cliffs, thousand feet high above the lake, sheer cliffs. Uh, and everything in this park is, has been sculpted by the glaciers. A billion years ago or more, this continent split in two and a huge rift valley formed from here right down to the American Midwest and big lava flows came out and it formed this hard cap rock that you see on top of the sleeping giant 
And so that cap rock covered the sedimentary seas and later that was sculpted out by glaciers. So what you have here now is a really raw, rugged landscape that um, has these immense, beautiful landforms. Sleeping Giant Provincial Park is surrounded by dense northern boreal forest. There are bogs, there are red pine forests, white pine forests, highland spruce forests, aspen birch, mixed uh, boreal forests with the balsam fir and birch, which is what we have here. The forest provides shelter to hundreds of species of migratory birds. The park's role is very important to us because uh, the entire peninsula, some 90 square miles, is, uh, is protected. So it's, it's natural habitat for all these birds that are moving through this area. So there's food out there for them in this forest. It's a place for them to fatten up for their journeys. Um, as these, these forest birds move through uh, the rest of the continent, uh, they have to find little patches of forest in which to rest and feed. So it makes, makes for a good jumping off point for them. The park juts out into Lake Superior, the largest of the five Great Lakes in North America. Well, Lake Superior is a, an inland sea. It's a lake which can be flat calm one moment, and then almost without warning, you can get major squalls that will form. So the winds will, will rise, the, the waves will become quite large, and you're doing some white knuckle sailing for a while. So really the, the lake can be a pretty scary place to be. Uh, you can never take Lake Superior for granted. Sleeping Giant is home to 64 kilometers of hiking trails, which showcase the park's geography. Sleeping Giant offers some amazing scenery and it's also very accessible, which I think is one of the most unique features of the park. The trail system is so developed and actually the largest trail system in Ontario parks and offers visitors the ability to navigate through a variety of terrains and even um, take on some of the more challenging terrain up to the top of the Giant to get a panoramic view of Lake Superior. By protecting Sleeping Giant Provincial Park, visitors from around the world can experience the pristine wilderness of Northern Ontario. Further east, along the shores of Lake Superior, is Puckasaw National Park, a wilderness oasis in the heart of Ontario. Puckasaw National Park is the only national wilderness park in Ontario, Canada. The remote region covers more than 1,800 square kilometers on the north shore of Lake Superior. The park protects the largest stretch of undeveloped coastline in the Great Lakes. It was first established in 1978 and first opened to the public in 1983. 
Part of the reason why that five years lag period was they needed to build a bridge. There was no bridge coming across the Pick River to access the front country of the, of the park. Wildlife in Pakistan roam freely with minimal human interference. The Ojibwe First Nations have deep roots in Pakistan. When the um, park was established, uh, back in 1972, they formed an agreement with all the First Nations that uh, formed the Robinson Superior Treaty. Uh, there's about eight First Nations in uh, Pick River. A First Nation is my First Nation. It was precedent setting for the time. It was established in collaboration with the local First Nations. So there were 12 groups as part of the Robinson Superior Treaty group. And these 12 groups um, were, they were consulted with and they created and signed this agreement that uh, created the national park for the area. For thousands of years, this land has been home to the First Nations people. 50% of staff at Pakasa is First Nations. The park offers solitude and wide open spaces, making it the perfect escape for paddlers and hikers. Pakistan National Park is, has amazing, amazing cliffs to paddle by. And then there's all kinds of sandy beaches that you can park your boat on. And then usually that's where the waves will be really nice to surf on. Some of the places it almost seems as though it's uh, tropical because you have the crystal clear blue water and then the only thing that throws it off is the pine trees and spruce trees and stuff. We love it. Uh, it doesn't seem to matter what, what it's like. We love to be out on it. It's a rugged uh, shoreline. It's challenging because of the ruggedness. You, you know, once you're out onto the, shore, out onto the lake, uh, oftentimes, if it's raging out there, you're out. You're, you have uh, limited options in terms of uh, being able to land. So there's the inherent challenge and danger associated with being out there. Um, but there's the, the level of beauty that just cannot be found anywhere else. I'm sorry, but it's, uh, it's just, it's beautiful. Pakasaw's backcountry is dominated by spruce and white birch forests. The area is a haven for hikers, but accessing the park's interior requires preparation and planning. The coastal trail actually runs right along the uh, Crescent Beach here, and then it comes across and then heads south over to Fisherman's Cove, which is our next little uh, our next little bay, and, and this trail continues on uh, for at least another 20 or 30 kilometers uh, to the south of us, and uh, eventually ending up at the North Swallow River. We have designated sites uh, just along the, uh, the, the, the main beach, uh, right back here. Uh, so there's about four or five campsites there and uh, that, that's where people usually camp. Kayakers will, they can camp anywhere along the, the shoreline, you know, wherever you see fit or, you know, wherever it's, uh, wherever it's possible for them to land. But usually you'll see uh, kayakers camping right on the beach. But for the hikers, uh, there's designated sites in, in along the tree line. The, the biggest thing for me is that it's just so, pristine. 
So you walk these trails and uh, they're, you know, you don't see many buildings or many people. Um, and the habitat is very much intact. The forest is very healthy. So you have a very uh, natural um, and healthy suite of birds. And uh, yeah, it's been a great birding experience for me since I've been here. For many visitors, a trip to Canada's national parks is not complete without experiencing the rugged coastline and lush forests of Puckasaw. Some of the most natural and undisturbed wilderness parks can be found in Northern Ontario. Being a true wilderness park is, is one of the best things it's got going for itself. You can go uh, for days without seeing people, for one thing. You know, uh, if, you, if you happen to be out here by yourself, there's always something new to keep you coming back every year. Sleeping Giant offers people uh, a great opportunity for uh, wilderness enjoyment. It's a very pristine environment. Even though it's 50 miles from the nearest city, Thunder Bay, there's, uh, the air quality here is quite good. The water quality is very good. And so people can come here and experience uh, a pristine environment where well, they will see wolves and bear and moose and deer and it's really a pretty well-kept secret. It's not that far from major centers in North America. The human history out there is relatively undisturbed. And so we can learn a lot about native people, but we can also learn a lot about the fur trade. We can learn a lot about uh, the, 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 the whole evolution of, of life in North America by setting aside places like Quetico.